welcome. We get the last the last session, so you, you guys are very tired by the end of the day. So we'll get lots of uh, lots of participation uh, to uh, keep you guys busy. As I said, we we, um, we thought we'd have a presentation uh, with a screen, but it, one of my roles is, is to be just overseeing the family and children's ministry. Uh, so uh, Graham and I actually met uh, beginning of September, maybe before Labor Day. So we first sat down to talk about whether we could talk about this. Um, so we went back in the summer. Yeah, we've been. It was, it was right back in the summer. It was worse. Yeah. Was it even before yeah, that when school was, was still yeah. on. So this has been this uh, presentation has been months in the making. So I'm sure you will. Know. <laughs> All the work has been going into. We it. did plan ahead, so that's yeah. good. Um, but uh, it's something that it was quite clear to both of us once we started talking that uh, it's something that's both important to us personally because we have children our own. We both have children and um, also just to see children in our uh, worshiping communities is very important. So, mm -hmm. so I, I wanted to want to begin with an introduction of saying so who you are and what's your a very quick um, best experience of worshiping with children. Um, so children within your uh, within your own experience of worship. Um, so we're not talking about um, Sunday school, not talking about messy church. Um, what's your best experience of having children um, in worship? And again, this might be a once-off, but sort of, again, so who you are, and if you have that, <coughs> sort of that moment of... We're saying sort of worship slash liturgy sure. slash communion, however yeah, you I guess kind so. of yeah, visualize yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, right, we can start with you, Jeff. Okay, um, I'm Jeff. Um, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. okay. Um, probably seeing my 19-year-old uh, daughter deliver the sermon in a youth Whoa. service. Okay. Was okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'm Elaine, and I probably actually have this the photo in my phone. The uh, the worship pastor was playing the piano, and his little daughter wanted daddy at that moment. So she ran up to the front of the church, climbed up on his lap, and he, while he continued to play, and while she then just sort of sat on her lap, clinging to him, and you know, that was perfectly okay. It was not seen as disruptive at all, and it was just, I, I, I actually had the photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm April, and I'm, I'm awash with memories as you, invite us to recall one, but one specific one this summer really made my heart smile. I picked up my cousin's kids from camp with her, and we started singing worship songs on the way home, and it mm. just touched me so much. Mm. I'm Julie, and um, I guess about 25 years ago, I was at Church of the Redeemer at Blue and Avenue Road, and uh, the 9.30 service was a family service, contemporary service, and we had a circle around the altar for communion. And there was a nice, uh, thick, blue carpet up there, which was great. And it was great because all the toddlers and babies came up, and they were crawling around while the prayers were being said. And some of them had little, you know, um, toys and things, but they were fairly quiet, I have to say. It was just such a wonderful experience with the adults standing around and the children, you know, playing on the, on the carpet around the altar. I'm Catherine. I'm oh, sure it must be neighbors because I'm down at uh, Woodbine in Kingston <coughs> Road. Oh, yes, then we must be. Yes, yes. Um, every year at, uh, on uh, Good Friday, I do a, a Good Friday program with the children. And uh, one of the things I've done is you know, we're going around different stations throughout the building. Uh, but as um, I come to talk to the children about uh, the Last Supper, uh, we come and gather around the altar, which at that point is stripped bare, mm -hmm. and so, um, and I've pulled out crackers and little glasses of juice, and so standing there with the children standing around actually eating off the bare altar, mm -hmm. uh, and just using the altar as, as it's meant, as a, as a table. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, well, <coughs> Leonard, Leonard, my best experience, I would say, is uh, in the form of uh, a youth retreat. I was there as spirit support at the time. And I, I was quite engaged in having the young people involved, actually leading the prayers. And so that's that really has stood out for me over the years. I mean, that I think mine is I have 
four kids were watching my younger ones um, participate in the traditional dance at church for the mm -hmm. first time. Yeah. Like it brings tears to my eyes to see that they're actually practicing here in the every yeah. yeah. school in church. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that's my view. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Shane. I, um, I guess I go to uh, the Church of St. Mary Magdalene. And so uh, I guess what the first thing that came to mind was last Palm Sunday we started in a park right next to uh, the church and uh, we passed out some uh, musical instruments and we did a, a march sort of around the, the property and so forth and uh, then into the church. So it was a neat kind of feeling of all of the generations kind of mingling in together, being really loud and then kind of uh, going into worship together. It was, it was, uh, yeah, thanks so much. <clears throat> experience. I like um, watching everyone come up for communion mm -hmm. and um, say all that when they get their communion. Mm -hmm. like it's, yeah. it's heartwarming. Yeah. Hi, I'm Megan. I started at the Church of the Redeemer this past Sunday. Um, I could never choose one favorite. <laughs> I'll share with you one. There you go. <laughs> um, the day I was ordained a deacon at the cathedral and the big solemn procession came around from the outside into the church and my kids were with a babysitter in a small chapel space and I looked through the glass doors and my son was standing behind the altar and he had his goldfish crackers on the altar and a sippy cup chalice like this and I, I, said, oh, I said to the, my sponsoring priest who was beside me I said look Matthew's presiding at the Eucharist and he's like yeah, I, know. Wow, I hope the bishops in this procession are like <laughs> Some people might see that as kind of sacrilegious, but it, at the time he was only five, and I thought, wow, he's really absorbed a lot in his little life. Yeah. Um, to really get what this is about. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And I think that, so the, great to hear all, and I think what Megan's talked about, the absorbing in their little life, um, is what we want to talk about today. What does it mean to worship together, and how do we learn um, that Sunday isn't the time to separate, to segregate, um, but it's actually a time when people, we can all learn a lot, and we can learn a lot from children um, as much as them from us. So I think we want to do it a couple ways. We want to start with a bit of a, a framework of theology, so sort of what are some theological reasons that worshiping God as a body or together is important. Um, then we're going to have you guys break up into groups, so we'll see about groups of three or so, um, three and four, uh, two, three, and one, four, into some Bible study passages, which you have sort of down there, and we'll, I'll hand out the, the actual passages, um, just to talk about what are some biblical ways to... Um, to, to approach children, and what are some passages, or some, some of the big passages from Matthew, and um, they're all from Matthew. Could have picked Luke or Mark, but just, uh, just happened to be all from Matthew. Uh, and then we'll look into some practical things, um, which I hope you'll bring your own sort of suggestions to. This is not just us sort of telling you uh, practical ways. As I said, I'm no expert. Um, but to share some practical things that we can do um, to incorporate children on a, on a regular basis in Sunday. Would you have to have another handout? Yes, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have, we have extra. We, yeah, we were told to print 15, so. So if you have a friend who benefit from this information, that would be great. <laughs> So I think one of the things is many people in our churches, growing up in the 50s and 60s, uh, or sort of growing as children in that era, um, and, and before that, their, their history is actually that they grew up in, in church, in worship. Uh, and so in some ways, this is something getting back to an older time. You know, Sunday school was always after the service. It was always before the service. And yet, culture has changed um, between now and then. Um, and so we have to, you know, there was a time when children were silent in public. There was a time when that was expected. There was a time when, uh, you know, children were not as free as they are today in all of society. Um, society's changed to the point where there is actually no place where children are expected to be quiet anymore. Uh, I, uh, sure, <laughs> sure, the symphony. So, and gen but generally there's an age, there's an age level, right? So yeah. you don't bring th three-year-old to the symphony. Um, but it's, it, it, the ways that we approach children in culture has changed, and yet the church has sometimes decided to stay in an era um, that is long past. And so I want to, again, talk about some of why we need to change and uh, why we need to embrace. So the, the four theological understandings I want to talk about are the understanding that of the body of Christ, God's special concern for children, 
the theology of the Incarnation and the purpose of liturgy. So I'll start with the theology of the Incarnation, which is the third on your list, but that sort of gets to the idea of culture. Um, the church needs to seriously consider what it means to engage with our culture. If we believe that the church is meant to incarnate, that, you know, that Jesus came down, God came down and lived amongst us, and the church is a representative of that, we can't be incarnating into a culture that no longer exists. We can't be incarnating into the 60s, the 50s, the 70s, or before. Because um, some, some church traditions are, are, that's where they see their culture, uh, cultural identity. And so it's, we, if we really want to embrace that theology of our incarnation, we have to think about where has the culture shifted and how does the church need to react? Moving on, so again, I, these are just some basic, I don't want to get too deep into that. Um, understanding that children are part of the body of Christ. Um, we, we talk about this, this is sort of the, 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 the church is the body of Christ. There's some great, great um, passages in scripture. Some of my favorite stuff, from, uh, my favorite book is Ephesians and sort of the imagery of the body um, that we use. Uh, and the body, you know, if you cut off a hand, is not the body. And if you, if you remove the eyes, is not the body, and so on. And Paul's imagery of that, that it's knit together. Um, we talk about that children are the future of the church. And I think that's one of the worst things we can say. Um, they're not the future. They are they're, they're the church today. Um, and I think when we see them as the future, um, we forget, again, that that they're part of the church, that they are part of um, God's people, not, and they, you don't graduate to become God's people. I mean, it, it, particularly if you're, uh, if you're an infant, if you, if you believe in infant baptism, and I know not everyone in this room does necessarily, um, they, be, they become part of the church at the font. The font is our entry into the, into the, into the church. And I, and I think in other traditions, certainly dedications or sort of into the family, they're, that, they're part of the church. You know, right from the get-go. If, if it's a Christian family, they're part of the church. <coughs> and so by segregating parts, like if you think about it, if we, if we segregated our bodies apart, so we wouldn't be a body anymore. So by segregating people outside of the body, so by segregating children, segregating youth, sort of, segre segregating seniors, and if you start thinking about this in other ways, it's, it's nonsensical. We would never segregate out you know, our 80-year-olds and say, okay, you need a special, uh, or, or, or our, you know, our, and some do segregate men and women, but I think most of us now we don't. You know, there's that sense we we believe in an integrated body, and so I think for us to take seriously the theology of the body of Christ, we need to think deeply about what it means to send children downstairs, and it's almost always downstairs. Is there anybody who has Sunday school that isn't in a basement? I had a different church. Yeah. It was upstairs. Here. You guys did. Here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Here. It's, it's, it's upstairs. Yeah. At another church, we were in another building. Another yeah. building. <laughs> okay. Did you think you three were out in a different building? Right. Or anyone under the same roof? Right. 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 Yeah. Now, is there anybody in here who, um, whose uh, children's ministry uh, starts at the beginning of the service so the kids go straight to children's ministry and they don't go just, where the just rest of the. Right. Well, See, friend yeah. at the United Church, they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So that's not uncommon either, is to have, uh, to go straight into Kidsmen, mm -hmm. and you're there for Kidsmen, and then when this, and you're, it lasts as long as the adult service lasts, and then they come back together again. So, um, mm -hmm. so but we're saying that's, uh, we feel that's something that we should think mm -hmm. and reflect on. Yeah, and I mean, I think none of this is, I think there are times, I mean, we even when you talk about, you know, segregating out into small groups and all that, there are times for that. Um, but if Sunday is our main opportunity to gather, it's something we really need to think about, is what are we saying to our children, what are we saying to ourselves, um, that they are not part of our main gathering, our main opportunity to worship God, um, to encounter Him in music, in liturgy, in word. Moving a bit to sort of a... Uh, the, the Old Testament and sort of throughout the Old Testament, I think, um, there's that the special concern for children. Um, as, as, as Stephanie said, you know, the book of Deuteronomy is essentially a handbook for raising uh, faithful children. And, and, you know, and again, it's the, there's that, that consistent theme of concern for orphans in particular. So again, but that sense of the marginalized, the weak, those who are, and, and you know, and children are. Um, the weak amongst us, right? And so I think, again, if we are going to lay hold to God's covenant um, with Israel as and sort of the extension and fulfillment in Jesus, we have to take seriously that, that sort of sense. And what do, again, if, what are we saying to our children if we're, if we're separating them out? Are we being specially concerned about them? 
And then finally, I want to move to the last point, the purpose of liturgy, or the purpose of worship. Um, what we do on a Sunday is instructive. Um, liturgy means work of the people. Uh, and it's meant to shape and form us over time. And then we don't think about this, but um, you know, what the words we sing, the words we pray, um, they're meant to shape us. Uh, and they're meant to shape everyone. And I do think liturgy has the power to form and shape even children. Um, I, my, I have a three-year-old daughter, and uh, sort of one of my best memories is my supervisor, who's left the parish now, um, invited her, when she was two still, um, to stand at the table, so stand at the altar, uh, and to watch him uh, do communion. And then at home, I think it was a couple weeks later, she started to um, pass out, we had little wooden um, coasters, and so she would pass out to us and say, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, <laughs> right? And so, you know, and again, yeah, two. This is a two-year-old. This is not, you know, she's not five, six, seven. She's already, you know, imagining whether or not, you know, she's not deeply engaging with it. Um, but that liturgy had a deep impact on her. And, you know, so much so that she wants to receive bread over and over again because, you know, she wants to, doesn't want that, just that little piece, right? So she goes up, and she goes up multiple times when she's at it. Um, and my wife's Presbyterian, so the, uh, they do communion less often. And, uh, but they have grape juice there and we have wine. And so she knows, but she knows the difference. Again, so the, I, I think she's a, you know, she's a bright three-year-old, but she's, this is a three-year-old who is already, who is experiencing worship and actually thinking about it and making the differentiation. Oh, daddy's church has wine. Mommy's church has grape juice. Uh, and, you know, again, I think we, we forget how open children are to the world. We forget how, how much, I mean, they're learning constantly. And I think we really do them uh, an injustice um, when we say, oh, no, you can only learn from someone that's gearing it yourself. So again, that's sort of, those are, um, that's a very, very brief sort of theological basis. And I want you guys now to, we're going to break you guys out into um, Bible study. And so the three passages we have are Jesus at the temple, um, the greatest in the kingdom, and then Jesus and, uh, and the little children. So we've already, some people have already, we've already dealt with some of this during some of the uh, workshops today. So. Yes. There's lots of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, just, I mean, and you're each gonna, each group is gonna deal with different. So you guys are gonna feed back to, to the group. We're gonna, <laughs> here we go. So we provided a little bit of background for you about the passage, where it comes from. What are you needing? To do? Oh, at the temple. Eighteen. Oh, they're oh, it's they're the on. Back side. You, you put them on the back side. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. the B side. This is the one I thought. So. So just as it says on the sheet, if as as a group of three or four. Um, if you could kind of cluster so you can see and hear each other. Um, if you, please read the passage quietly on your own. And then uh, if one person could read the passage out loud to the group. And then uh, uh, Graham's put together some great questions. So if you could go through and um, uh, discuss the questions together. But yeah, if you could start by reading quietly. From our own approach to worship and, and children. Uh, so, start with group one? Start with, yeah, we'll say group one over here. Yeah. So, you were given Matthew 21, which is Jesus cleansing the temple. Uh, which is where I thought it ended. But then there's another chunk to it. That's right. <laughs> of the children. Yeah. Jesus heals the lame in the halt. The children see this and they start shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Right. And I forgot that part completely. <laughs> right. <laughs> The cleansing bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, yeah, and then, yeah, so there's the cleansing, and then, yes, the. Yeah. So, okay. And, and part of our discussion centered around that, that the children were leading. Mm. And the chief priests, who also saw the healings yeah. and also saw the cleansing, reacted. <laughs> right. And, like, my question is were they indignant at the healings or indignant at the children? Mm. Well, probably both. Well, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just generous, indignant. <laughs> <laughs> Both extreme reactions to the ex same thing. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the children were leaving. So uh, did you get sort of any ideas on how that might sort of inform our, our worship <laughs> as you laugh? Well, uh, just allowing the kids to be exuberant and to the, not get that, oh my goodness, they're being disruptive, but to allow that exuberance and that joy mm -hmm. to inform our response. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm going to just move. Um, we had uh, the Matthew 19, the, uh, the one which we referred to earlier this mm -hmm. morning about uh, uh, the disciples uh, holding back the children and uh, Christ inviting the children to come forward. Um, and we were asked sort of what motivation might the disciples have in keeping the children from coming to Jesus. And uh, just basically logistics. Um, you know, important people get to see important people. Right. The people of less value are pushed behind in the mm -hmm. mouths. We right. see it today with famous uh, people and important yeah. people. Um, in uh, what ways might we, like the disciples, also stop children from encountering uh, Jesus? Um, it's again uh, the same sort of thing. We don't think they, we, we patronize the children. We don't think that they're going to understand these concepts. Um, we place greater, uh, lesser value or importance on our children, uh, which is reflected in the budget that we set aside <laughs> right. for yeah. children's ministry. So that's a good point. Uh, the reality is also kids are a nuisance and they can be noisy. And if you have practiced a, a beautiful, special worship moment, a, an anthem or a, a, a special homily, and uh, you don't want to mess it up by right. yeah. kid crying. Yeah. It's so, natural, yeah. It's yeah. Nice, yeah. Um, and uh, the next question, which was, uh, what qualities do children possess that make Jesus say? Um, it is such it as these such that, that, yeah. these, that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And it was interesting, I asked the kids in my Sunday school this question just a couple of weeks ago. Good. So we were started looking at you know, the qualities of children um, that Christ saw was their humility, their openness, their sense of wonder, mm -hmm. their willingness. Right. Okay. And so how might this passage inform? Uh, our own approach. Okay, to no, not course. to worry, that's fine. <laughs> we'll talk about a bit that in the, in the practical sessions so, and the final group. Yeah, so we had in Matthew 18, 1 to 5, um, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, who is the Jesus and Jesus. Um, one thing we discussed was that at the time that this story originated, children were not valued in quite the same way as they are now. So, uh, and, and this was very apparent to me. I, w I worked at a baby show yesterday, like a trade show about cool stuff for your kids. Right? Um, that's a very different cultural mindset than this mindset. So it might be interesting to replace child in this reading with other marginalized groups, mm. whether that be a refugee or a homeless person, someone with mental illness, someone who is gay, someone who is marginalized right. in our current culture. We might hear the story differently. In terms of qualities do children possess, um, a number were named. Um, joy and enthusiasm and curiosity came up. Um, another really interesting one that Jennifer mentioned was kids are being sort of corrected and shaped and directed and sort of disciplined all the time and actually take it better than adults. Um, and so maybe could I expand on that to say kids are actually better learners. <laughs> kids are more actively right. learning all the time and, and actually changing and shaping their behavior mm -hmm. in a much more malleable way than many adults are. Is that fair? Yeah. 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 It's totally yeah. Fair. Okay. And then um, what are some of the ways you might experience the presence of Jesus in a child? Again, similar things that the joy, I, I think of the prayer we say in baptism in an Anglican tradition, may you have the gifts of joy and wonder in mm -hmm. all of God's works, that, that children capture that right. in an entirely different way and sort of trying to harness that energy in worship rather than just sort of sit there and be quiet. But how can you make that energy and curiosity and joy vibrant and, and appropriate in a worship mm -hmm. setting? So right. that it's, so that it's uh, I don't know, informing the experience <clears throat> and improving the experience for everybody rather than uh, sort of being contained. Sure, yeah. And I think that's something I've been deeply convicted on is that joy I think is the purpose we're created is to, I mean, one of the things the Westminster Confession says, the chief end of man, um, but you know, it's good old, good old, old fashioned language, but is to worship and enjoy God, right? Um, and so I do think there's that sense of, of enjoying God, um, which is the purpose of our life. Um, and as Megan said, 
you know, I think my kids are much better at joy than I am. Uh, so I mean, they're also much better at you know, breaking down, uh, you know, in tears and all that. But there's that sort of the, the, the extreme, right? It's the extreme depth of emotion. Children will often ask a really good question that an adult might be too shy to ask. Yeah. Because an adult is like, I'm worried that I don't look smart enough. Because yeah. a child just asks. It, it actually yeah. is quite insightful. Mm -hmm. And there's no, yeah, there's no hesitation, no embarrassment, no. Um, unless we give it, unless we give it to them, and that's sort of yeah. one of the things. And, and sort of socialization kind of beats that out of them in yeah. a way. But um, when kids are really unselfconscious, mm -hmm. I, I think that shows a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. They don't have the ego that adults have. They haven't yeah. developed yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes we, um, I'm going to move on to practical suggestions if you want to flip your page, but uh, just thinking about that, um, uh, sometimes we, uh, we can use, uh, harness the joy of children, but not, but for our own enjoyment mm -hmm. or pleasure, right? And uh, so I think about something like a children's talk. I think children's talks at worst are really just ways of uh, us parading children in front maybe for a laugh or to be cute um, and um, how many times has a child said something when you've heard a children's talk and I, I may have I've probably done it myself so <laughs> ask for God's mercy yeah. <laughs> uh, and for the child's mercy but uh, where the children says something ch child says something very funny and the congregation assembled laughs right mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's okay but sometimes the child says something that's uh, uh, maybe a little bit embarrassing or revealing, and that's not the point of a children's talk, right? So we have to be very careful about, um, uh, yeah, I think using the children as props, right, rather than engaging with them in, as a community well, level. Well, ask kids questions that most adults couldn't ask. So right. The number of times yeah. I've heard a priest in a children's talk say, what day is it today? And they're yeah. like, yeah. like, well, it's the Feast of All Saints. And yeah. the child goes, it's Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then when buddy first laughs, no, you're wrong. Well, actually, no, you're yeah. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Even yeah. if you get that kind of answer, you can say, yes, Sunday, and today, this Sunday, is... It's right. And if, a way to find if we take advantage of that goodwill of that child, like, if, yeah. like, mm. and laugh, then when we say it next week, we say, oh, what day is it? That child is most likely going to say nothing, and for a very long time, right? So that's a good way for us to teach children to to be quiet, right? Yeah. So I mean, so in in some ways, the children are being are almost always earnest. Um, you know, when you ask them a question, they're going to answer it. Uh, and yes, there are jokesters and this kind of stuff, but that is a learned behavior. But they, they when they when you ask them a question, they're going to give you the answer they think is right. Yeah. Um, and so to honor that, I mean, I think, and so often um, the children's talk is not doing that. That sort of sense of um, because it's sort of it's again maybe raising them on a pedestal to say, look at the kids we have, or look at the you know look at the the, the face of our you know the future face of our church. It's sort of that that tokenism yeah. um, that kind of think be at the heart of um, all, not all. I mean, I think there's it's a it's a misguided like there there's a, there's a good reason why we want to do the thing. We want to sort of. Um, celebrate children. We want to do all those things, but then we end up um, breaking their trust. We end up making them not, you know, scared to, to answer questions of faith. Uh, and yeah, Julie. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, but just on the point of trying to redeem the children. So yeah, sure. <laughs> and then this is yeah, this is some practical. So this is a conversation of practical. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I'm not saying this is the right way or a good way mm -hmm. to do it, but. Just being aware of that, yeah. I use the oral story with Bible. Yes. So, basically, the kids come up, and we do have the children's chat after the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and they come up, and I just say, it's so wonderful to see you here. And it is, isn't it a wonderful thing that we are here learning what it means to follow Jesus? Mm -hmm. And um, then I basically, there might be an introductory question about that relates to their lives about the theme, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, but nothing theological or anything, nothing, nothing mm -hmm. difficult. Um, and then I read them the story, yeah. and then I close the book, mm -hmm. and we say a prayer. Yeah. And they're silent, you mm -hmm. see. So it's not like trying to draw the meaning yeah. out of the text or anything right. while I'm up there. Yeah. That's something the Sunday school can mm -hmm. do, the parents can do, or yeah. somehow they can get it. So we just pray together and they go. Mm -hmm. And so far, it seems to have worked OK. Yes. But it's not the kind of, yeah, I know what you mean, like, Trying to get the cuteness out of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think what that does is it, it's actually saying that this is time is for you. Yeah. Um, and so you're actually dedicating that time to the kids, whereas mm -hmm. many of those talks, as Julie said, are for the adults. It's right. sort of, and you know, 
my, my wife will sort of challenge me on this to some degree because she this is an, uh, an area of expertise she has more uh, she's a she's at her synod um, but uh, that sometimes actually parents uh, adults can get a lot out of the children's Absolutely. talk right That's so I mean true. it is but you have to think about why you're doing it yeah. um, because if it if it's to engage the children and to, to be with them um, yes the kids might be able to uh, the adults might be able to get something out of it but um, Again, you have to think about sort of: Are you just using them as a prop for the for the adults at entertainment? Mm -hmm. Are you just using them as a prop for adult learning? Uh, and then, yeah. So. Is, we would never say. Would everyone who's fifty-five to seventy please come to the chancel steps for right. a little lesson yeah. and be put mm -hmm. on display? Mm -hmm. So, what I wonder is, if it's working for you, can you do it for the whole community? Can it be a moment? Because because why do we need spectators? Right. Too, of the kids but, they but they are drawn in. They're drawn in by the yeah. story. They're yeah. drawn in by the story and they're drawn in by the silence. Mm -hmm. And they're drawn in by the prayer. Because the, the adults are just as part of that as mm -hmm. the children are. Yeah, so that's an so, improvement over yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. But yeah. You know, can, can, people, can the whole community be centered in the same way? If that's what, mm -hmm. what the kids are experiencing. Right. Uh, and that's a good, also, good question. Released, yeah. which, is, which this, this is more yeah. that I use, they've heard the gospel. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. It, it's a warm up for them for when they're listening to the sermon. Right. For the adults. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if the kids stay for the sermon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and the kids do it. but it's something to play with, right? It's something to yeah. try. I know yeah. uh, this fall um, yeah. we've stopped doing regular children's talks mm -hmm. um, and introduced instead another song, a hymn that they can yeah. that it, mm -hmm. they hopefully can sing. And um, uh, and I do children's talks sometimes <laughs> at my choice instead of being every week. So yeah, we're playing with it. It's probably, probably nobody likes it, but that's what we're doing. And so I want, now we can move to some practical suggestions. And like I said, these are, this is a very short list. And so I hope that some of you guys can, can bring up some ideas as how can we worship with children um, to, you know, together as a congregation. Um, and so, you know, one of the things is mentor programs. One of the things that I've um, uh, I've seen in practice places where children can be paired with, with people that are in ministry. Uh, you know. The average Sunday, there are, there are probably more than a dozen different things that are going on. Mm -hmm. um, greeters, um, people taking up the offering, people are you know, collecting uh, prayers, readers. There's, you know, we do, there's so many different things in the church, and yet, you know, children, especially if they're sent down to Sunday school, they're going to, you know, don't get to even see half of it. And so I think, you know, again, it's one of those things. You know, maybe you have to do this well, and you know, pair them with an adult that's patient, that's kind, all those you know, good Christian virtues. And, and you know maybe over time they learn those roles, um, so that it's not you know once a month you have a, an intergenerational service that sort of says yes you know here it is but you know maybe these they can be actually be part of um, of the service over you know every week. Mm -hmm. So and if you have say for example a child who does uh, participates with the reading right there are some children that are just take to reading out loud like ducks to water, they then learn the shape of our liturgy right that we have readings at this point in our liturgy every week, or say the offertory, if they help with the offertory, right? We, our liturgy has its uh, deliberate flow and for a reason, then they start to learn that. And that's really also one of our uh, key things is that, that children, as, as Graham said right at the beginning, that liturgy is a way to teach, right? Mm -hmm. So they can and, enter And every in. liturgy is. I mean, we're both Anglican, yeah. but I think every, every any worship service. Liturgical, non-liturgical. Yeah. Even the non-liturgicals, <laughs> you have a pattern to your worship. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that does shape who we are. And, yeah. and again, it's sort of, if, if kids are going to want to be in that, that worship for the rest of their lives, they need to know it. It needs to be ingrained within them. And so I do think, again, and, and what better way than to serve and to help lead um, you know, and sort of that, that conversation from that Bible study, the children were leading, right? That sort of the ch in, in, in Jesus, you know, in Jesus' day, the children were leading. Um, and that, that might be hard to do, but sort of what, what are some ways that that, you know? Mm. Um, so, yes, we're, we have another one of our points is this about uh, integration of the, of the children, right? Um, now, so we, and we kind of had that conversation already about, um, you know, uh, children's focus or children's talk is one way to include children. Um, it, and we're saying just make sure you're doing it well. Um, but uh, there are other ways to have uh, kids participating. So like you sort of marry the mentor thing to the integration thing and they, they mm -hmm. kind of work well together. 
Yeah, so I mean, and one of the other ways, and I think this is a great way um, to get kids sort of um, comfortable with worship, um, is ha have their Sunday school mirror um, your worship time. Now, and that might allow for greater movement, you know, greater, um, you know, if, for example, um, you're in a tradition where the sermon is a big part of, you know, then, you know, maybe there's that point of, of a teaching period for them. Now, it's not going to be sort of a lecture, but, you know, have it, have it be, um, you know, a children's church that is reflective of your community. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're a high liturgical church, don't have it just be sort of open, you know, open season, because, again, kids, they're not going to stick into your community um, if they haven't experienced um, what it is your community is about. I mean, if, if all they're doing is playing games, if all they're doing is you know singing songs, if, and 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 maybe hearing a story, which is great. Those are you know those are good things. But you know when the time it comes to be a teenager and they're you know they don't have programming every Sunday or or, or whatever it is, or or when they're in university and there's no programs for them, um, they've had no connection um, to your worshiping life. Mm -hmm. And so why would they stay? Because um, they, they may even be faithful Christians, um, but on a personal level, right? I mean, um, but they've had no connection to the to community, which I believe is sort of essential to be, I mean, to be a Christian. You know, we're meant to be together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're meant to pray for one another, support one another. And, and one of the best times to do it is on Sunday, because that's when we get to know each other. We are almost out of time, so I, I one of the uh, last bullet there is, is uh, recommending that you try introducing a, a sermon series on what it means to be a child. Like, we're all children of God, right? We're in the family of God. We're all children of God. Could you riff on that for a sermon series? Mm -hmm. um, that might be a great way to um, take some of the great uh, theological foundations that Graham was talking about earlier and just spend some time as a community looking at those. The other thing um, I, we didn't put in there, um, but it just occurred to me as we we're talking, is yeah. that we do um, at our church we do all age services. Um, so I would initially we called them children's services, but then I realized that they weren't children's services. We wanted everybody to feed together, right? Um, so uh, that's a whole other kettle of fish. But uh, if you want to talk about that, I'd be happy. What's that look like? <laughs> uh, we do them irregularly, um, but. They're, um, they're still, we still have communion. We still uh, have uh, some, some worship, uh, still have offertory. So the, the framework is there, but we just change things around a little bit. Yeah. And so yeah, I guess for the last five minutes, we have five minutes. Oh no, I guess are we? Uh, yeah, we know. We well, don't. Let's just say we have five minutes. OK, let's pretend, uh, we, have, we'll pretend <laughs> we have five. We're right to have five minutes. Uh, <laughs> Questions, comments about sort of ways that either you do it. So, Jenna, I just want to give Jennifer first because you had your hand up. Sure. I, I had a question about um, these intergenerational services. Yeah. Because whenever we've done them, children have been highly involved in them. Yep. Which means you have to prep children yep. so much more. And it doesn't, for many people, for many adults, going to service is a time to sit, reflect, to hear. When we have children's services, or my experience of them, we have children like, working them, which is great, but then you yeah. have to build in so much time to prepare the children. Yeah. And it it almost seems, I, I just, yeah. other people's experience on that, like I, I just feel like sometimes it's almost too much yeah. to organize it, to have it. So it either it's all our Sunday school time for three weeks to prepare kids to do this, yeah. and or we meet on Saturdays, the day before, to get them all ready, and then we have fast parents, can you come in, because you're we all want to have chill, church together. Your kid has to be involved. <laughs> what, what's your thoughts around that? Uh, well, so uh, I, I don't. Yes, yeah, we, in, uh, we. In, so I'm trying to include everybody. I don't. Um, uh, so, for example, um, uh, at the end of the school term in. June <laughs> in 2015, uh, we had someone visiting from I think a, a priest from Uganda. He was here for something, so he had he was just, he just showed up at the church and he wasn't part of my plan, but we had him come forward and he talked about his ministry and why he was in Toronto. And then uh, one of our leaders, worship leaders, in, invited all the kids to come around and pray for him. So like they don't need any prep for that. Um, the person who led the prayer led the prayer, and then some of the other kids prayed for him. They put hands on him, and uh, that didn't need any prep. And some of the kids didn't come. And that's going to be the case. You're going to have partial participation, and that's okay. I think, um, and it's going to be a little bit crazy. That's okay. But I think for something for like, I mean, St. Mary Magdalene's yeah, a very sort of different, you know, different liturgical mass. style. 
Yeah. Um, you know, maybe something like the mentor program it might work so that, you know, maybe not every kid, but sort of some kids are not going to be in Sunday school every week or they're like, they'll be, you know, they'll be up learning the job they're going to do in three weeks time. So if you have that, that sort of children, you know, that they'd be, they'd be with the person. So if, if they're going to read or if they're going to, you know, serve. Um, or whatever it is, Carry but they'd the spend you know they they'd spend some time um, with with that person in in the regular service, um, you know. For again, it wouldn't be the same kid. You wouldn't want to pull them out of Sunday school all the time. But there's sort of that sense of you know, maybe once a month, uh, if they're going to if there's going to be a service coming up, you say, okay, well, can you you know go up? You're going to have that. You're going to be mentored with it. You know, paired with this person who's going to tell you about the job and. And so then it is, you know, then it's less of a, a, you know, you don't have to get on there Saturday. I mean, it's still, it's, dealing with kids is always going to be more work. Um, I mean, in a, you know, mixing it in the regular service, especially if you want them in leadership. Um, but I do think there are ways around it that don't have to be sort of so heavy on that day. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, no, she, yeah, sorry. Well, I, I'd love to talk to you more about that, because I just, uh, last Sunday, we had an intergenerational. And I spent 40 hours. <laughs> Communicating with some parents before that, uh, so each child had the task and it's mm -hmm. But I wanted to raise a different topic. A different yeah. uh, we're in the process of doing, moving some cues and doing some reconfiguration in our sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea of having a children's play area within mm -hmm. the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I'm a mixed feelings. Like, mm -hmm. one, it's having a space for the children in the sanctuary. Yep. But then, are we actively teaching the children to disengage with what's going on? Here's some toys, here's some activity books, ignore what we're doing, just be quiet. Mm -hmm. Or do we not have a children's play area mm -hmm. and encourage the children to um, be aware of what's going on in service? Mm -hmm. And I We just pulled our, our area. We, we used to have something like that. And what would happen is the kids would come, come up from Sunday school, they would run to their parents, drop all their crap, and then head to the back of the church where the table was where there was more coloring and stuff to do. And they wouldn't come up until communion, and once their communion was done, they would right. back. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> That's my concern. Mm -hmm. Are we in doing that? Are we actively yeah. Yeah. encouraging the kids to disengage with the service? Well, yeah. we were finding they were actively disengaging from their own parents. That was the problem. Oh, so right. We want to keep them with their parents. Yeah. 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 They're worshiping as a family together. Yeah. So I think that's a really good point, Jeff. That in um, when we have when you have children in worship in. Uh, in the worship service, uh, encourage uh, parents to take a parental role in educating their children. There's a great opportunity, if you're not at the front, uh, to be sitting with the child and the prayer book. Like, you know, let's follow along. This is, we're going to say the creed, let's follow along, and you can point along, right? Or the hymns, opening up the hymn book and singing with them, like, you know, and that you stand up at certain times and now we're sitting down. And those areas right. also don't make it any less quiet or obnoxious either. I'm a no. father of three small children. <laughs> <laughs> they, in those areas, they can fight over crayons, yeah. Yeah. Fight over whose turn yeah. is to play with whatever toy. Yeah. And you and I've been back there where mm -hmm. you become this little problem. ghetto where you're <laughs> stuck at and people turn their heads and look back and say, look at what's going on in that little corner. And uh, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, not to discourage you, but it's. I don't think it achieves the goals that a lot of people think it, they will have. Yeah, we're, we've we're, had it a couple of We're actually experimenting with, with reserving a few pews right in the very, in the very front of the church because the idea is that the kids are bored because they can't see what's going on. Mm, so yeah. if we put them at the very front, they'll be able to see what's going on where yeah. the prayer concentration is going yeah. on and, and they'll be more involved. Now, we're only in week two tomorrow, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> well, and I mean, I think for you know, something, you know, when we have baptisms, and I, I think it's one of the things that I've seen and, and have taken on for myself is inviting kids up to the front to watch, you know, because, you know, I mean, whatever, again, whatever, even if you're sort of, you know, baptizing adults, um, for kids to see that and actually, you know, the, the, the actual act of water and, yeah. and, 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 you know, maybe even, you know, if you're doing it on a font, you know, get them wet, you know, pour from a high, you know, so that there's water. Uh, I know you so your chancel guild will, uh, will be mad at you, but, um, you know, liturgy is also drama. Yeah. Right, and, and it's also, I mean, it's not, not in a way that we're acting, but it's a, it is a drama. yeah, we're, we're displaying something beyond yeah. what's actually happening, yeah. right? Yeah. So in any worship, you know, you want to find ways, and I think kids are very much, you know, touch and sight and, and sound, but they're, you know, they're very visceral in, their, in their, their things. And so find those, you know, the ways, and get the kids right up, right up for the Eucharistic prayer so they can see the bread and, yeah. you know, or, or for what, you know, for that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can. My follow-up was sort of back to kids in liturgy, mm -hmm. and what I've settled on, and I don't have it right, 
<laughs> but I reuse activities, so I might do, I might teach them the Lord's Prayer in sign language, and then use it every Sunday for the season of Lent. Mm -hmm. So right. that eases the burden of practices and rehearsals because you're sort of getting more out of the one thing you taught them, mm -hmm. and then you can put it away for a while. Um, for intergenerational services, we did a mass setting that had a choral refrain, and the kids did actions during that. They led the whole congregation. And then they just knew that's our mass setting when we do the generation services. So you, there's a huge upfront training in the first time, but if you bring it back, mm -hmm. you don't have to do the rehearsal with every single. You're not reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. Another way to reduce prep time that our one church did is they had family groups do prayers mm -hmm. so that that's the great. parents had a theme yeah. and yeah. they worked on a prayer yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all the Absolutely. Role. I think that's a great practical way, yeah. yeah. So. And as they were able, like, I think my brother and this is and my sister in law and their kids did it and so my nephew is four yeah. saying the odd word my right. niece who's the aide could read the sentence. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. something. Yeah. Uh, instead of an actual play area with crayons and games and stuff, just an empty space mm -hmm. where when there's music, they can jump and dance yeah. around, Great. but then when the music's done, they go sit with their parents right. again. It yep. just gives them a place that they can wiggle. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, watching a bunch of little ones bounce around mm -hmm. when there's music, <laughs> when it's, really like, yeah. it's lovely. It's, it's so, yeah. <laughs> and if they're loud and they squeal, you're singing, the yeah. organ's playing. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but so you don't have, like, then you don't have the quibbling over crayons, but it's just mm. a space and they can just, they can let it out a little bit, you know, so when there's, you know, as long as the kids know when there's music, you can go there and dance around, yeah. and you can come back. That's a great idea. And I think, again, it gets to that joy, right, that sort of sense of experiencing joy. And I mean, I know I'm a father, so that, that sort of, and I have young kids, so they're noisy, and they're not with me, they're with my wife. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I really do enjoy it when my, my eldest at least comes because she's at least somewhat manageable. But um, they're, you know, I, I think kids really can give us a window into that pure joy. Um, that, you know, that the, 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 the concerns of the world get on our heads, you know, everything, right? And, and yet kids don't have that. Kids very much embody the live for today that Jesus says, right? And, and just sort of enjoy today and, and, and worry about today. So. Um, so yeah, that, I think we, Catherine is coming, so we're okay. done. Uh, it's a wrap! <laughs> so thank you for... Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>